Dr. Dan Siegel, thank you so much for joining us once again on the Science of Psychotherapy podcast. How are you? I'm doing well, Matthew. How are you going? We're doing well. And I'm here in Sydney, Dan. Nice to see you. You're looking for Hey, Richard. Great to see you. Now, Dr. Siegel, we want to talk to you today about your new book that you've co-authored, The Power of Showing Up, How Parental Presence Shapes Who Our Kids Become and How Their Brains Get Wired. First of all, congratulations on another book. Thank you. Thank you. Tina and I worked hard on it, and it's a pleasure to be here talking to you about it. Oh, yes. Um, so your co-author, tell us a little bit about your co-author, Tina Bryson. So Tina Payne Bryson is a wonderful social work person who's got her doctorate in social work. She actually used to be my student and then studied with me in many, for many years, became an active member of our immersion experience, and then... Um, you know, we started seeing her raise her first, her uh, first son, then her second son, then her third son with these ideas. And she's such a fantastic thinker and teacher uh, that we started collaborating together. And this is our fourth parenting book that we've written together now. Wonderful. Yes, it's lovely. Tina's been uh, uh, doing such fabulous work and it was very exciting, you know, to see you guys do another one. And it's something that you, you find very comfortable to do working because it's this nice balance uh, of uh, the different ideas that sort of the, the, the father and the, the mother, because you've got some wonderful kids yourself who I think perhaps are a bit more involved in your work now than they have been when they were little, little ones. Well, they, they've <laughs> it's a funny story, Richard, but uh, our son is now 30 and our daughter's 25 and, you know, about... Oh, I guess 10 years ago when Tina and I first started writing together, uh, my kids got old enough to ban me from using them as examples in the book. So I was really stuck as a parenting author, uh, now being banned by my adolescent children. Um, so so uh, uh, it was excellent that Tina was, you know, raising her children who were too young to ban her from using them as examples. And we started collaborating together. Uh, but, you know, my son is a musician, Alex Siegel. You can hear him on Spotify. Our daughter is an environmental science graduate student. So they're not working with us directly, but we have a very close family. And uh, so we're very involved in their lives and they and ours, but they're not literally working with us. Um, although sometimes during the um, intermission at conferences, I play Alex's music <laughs> well, I and try to give him a promo. Uh, well, Alex him, Siegel. Him yeah. yeah, well, I've seen him play yeah. a couple of times. He's yeah. a very fine, yeah, exactly. very fine musician. Yeah. Because uh, we, uh, we could all, I could start talking about grandchildren, then we'd be in trouble. So no, I won't do that. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, well, we should... As far as I know, we have none on our end. Uh, but you know, you're right too. Our daughter did the, um, she did the, she's an artist and she did the drawings for Aware, my last book. That's, that's right. right. So in that sense, she's working. Uh, with me, I mean, I've hired her to be my artist. Yes, we're still getting, but but let's let, let's focus on this one because uh, yeah. that's the trouble, Dan. You've got so many books, we could start wandering off into all the others. Let's focus here on. This well, one. people have asked me to do a book club. I got to tell you, Matthew and Richard, right. they said let's go through the fourteen books, you know. And uh, luckily, you know, th uh, one of those is just a new edition. And in fact, the Developing Mind, its third edition, will be out at the end of yeah. this year, and that would be a fun book to do a book club on. Uh, but uh, we haven't done that so far, but it, you could have a fun little book club. Each of them is a little different. Each of the books has its own reason to be, you know, so. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. And this one is just that thing on, on parenting then. And, you know, I've heard, uh, you know, we've talked about this, this thing, this idea of being present. Uh, it's in the, the concept is in your other books and early there. But this, this simple idea. Uh, simple, but it's actually, very simple. But it's actually not. So uh, tell yeah. us what, what drove you to, to think, well, we should write this. Yeah, well, that's a great question, Richard. You know, the, the first thing to say about, you know, writing a parenting book is for any of us that are parents, we know that there's so much pressure we put on ourselves and also guilt we feel that we didn't do it right. And then even if we try to push away the notion of perfect parenting, we kind of wonder, could I have done it better, you know, and, and all this kind of stuff. So when you realize that in your own journey as a parent, 
Um, certainly as a clinician, as a therapist doing psychotherapy, you want to be as supportive to the individual parent in front of you, or if you're working with a family, to the parents. So that's all fine and good to yourself, to your friends, to your patients, to your clients. But then when you write a book, you really get a, um, an uneasy feeling that you don't want to come off like saying there's the right way to do it, that I'm writing in this book, and the not right way, right way of doing it. So the first parenting book I wrote with Mary Hartzell was really all about that. It was saying there's no such thing as perfect parenting. And in fact, it's not about so much what you do or even what was done to you, but how you make sense of that and how to bring this reflective capacity to be present. So that's parenting from the inside out. And I never would have written another parenting book if I hadn't written that with Mary Hartzell. And, you know, Tina knew that and knew that book and knew that book was basically a translation of the first edition of the developing mind into parent language. It was like translating into English. And um, this book is essentially translating the third edition of the developing mind into parent language. Um, Cause the, this is coming out the same year as the third edition. So I've been spending the last two and a half years with 18 interns reviewing the current science of attachment and what do we know, you know, from the, the published literature and, and the work I do with my colleagues who are attachment researchers. So basically, Tina and I wanted to say, could we provide a really simple book that could make accessible the really intricate, as you're saying, Richard, deep notion of presence and how it manifests as the kind of parenting across the globe, different cultures, that would promote resilience and well-being and you know compassion and kindness in a child. So that's basically what the book is about. Mm -hmm. Can I just um, segue just a little bit into so the the third edition of the developing mind? And you've done you've done this process of review. Has there been anything? And this would reflect in the the book that you've just written for for parents. Has there been anything that has significantly shifted? Because we hear, you know, the neuroscience is changing all the time. And what we knew five years ago, half of it is not true anymore. So what have you discovered in terms of any major shifts? Well, Matthew, it's a great question. The, you know, soon I'll be doing a, um, I don't know if it's called a workshop or a panel or whatever it is with Bessel van der Kolk, mm -hmm. where we're going to address this exact question. Like, what was the promise of neuroscience, um, you know, in the last, whatever, 10, 20 years? and did it hold for the field of mental health and psychotherapy in general. So we're gonna dive into that together. Um, and when I had the 18 interns that worked with me to revise the second edition of The Developing Mind into the third, I said to them, like I said to the first group in going from the first edition to the second edition, you know, I want you to approach this revision by finding anything that goes against what was said in the prior edition so that we can find one study that goes against the main ideas, like, you know, integration is the basis of well-being, integration being linking differentiated parts, or like um, integrated relationships lead to integration in the brain, which leads to optimal regulation, which leads to health. That would be another example. Or a third example would be um, the mind is not the same as the brain in your head you know, a big proposition, right? So those three, so, and then anything, and we went literally line by line, just through this wall, you know, 18 interns, we worked for a year, we found thousands of articles, and to answer your question, Matthew, essentially, they could find nothing to go against these, and tons of stuff that actually was startling to a lot of the interns in really exciting for me after for doing this for 25 years to find even more empirical res research supporting those three basic ideas of interpersonal neurobiology. Integration is health. Relational integration leads to neural integration. And that's the optimal source of optimal regulation, optimal resilience, basically. And that the mind uh, is uh, likely a self-organizing emergent property of energy and information flow. We again could not find anybody who talks like that in the broader field of empirical science, right. which kind of was disappointing for me 
after writing about this for 25 years, <laughs> you know that people still don't talk like that. But nevertheless, um, we couldn't find anything to go against it. And then we could see that there were um, interesting, you know, what E.O. Wilson would call conciliant findings, where it was across different disciplines in independent ways, sociology or anthropology or linguistics might be finding certain discoveries that would fit with neuroscience and even with physics. So, you know, this was just a thrilling thing about this year adventure. Then what I did was I went through every one of those papers. It took me another year to read them, review the old papers. So there's about 2,300 uh, empirically reviewed research papers um, that are the references. I thought I was going to lose my mind now that we could define what the mind was. <laughs> you know, I thought I was going to lose it. Um, but I just, I just, I had to take like a, in terms of what Richard said, I had to just be really present for the experience, like honor that these 18 interns worked me for a year honor. I was going to take another year and a half to go through all that and then start the revision process. And in this edition, what I decided to do was weave which I never did it in the past, but weave some of the more um, um, hypothetical parts about the plane of possibility and the origin of consciousness and the probability function of energy, all this stuff. I would put those in separate paragraphs to say, look, this is a hypothesis. It could be completely wrong. But as you're reading this textbook, because it's a graduate school textbook, you could do the aware book learn from your own direct experience of your own experience with consciousness. Here's a siren. Should I turn it on mute or you're uh, okay? That's all right. They're coming that's for it. you. We, we, okay. We, we like it. It's, it's, it's enough in the background. The, so, um, you know, so we could then have the reader, unlike the other editions now, do their own practice with aware. <clears throat> and then amazingly for me as the writer, it was really exciting to see how some of the original ideas from the 90s could be illuminated in more depth. For example, the idea of presence and parenting uh, and secure attachment could be illuminated with more depth with this 3P model of the plane of possibility, the plateaus and the peaks. So that by the end of the book, um, there's a new chapter on identity integration and it's um, it allowed the reader to see they worked on it themselves. They got to experience this hypothesis that could be wrong, but it might be right. And if it is right, at least conciliantly, it fits with the whole model. Right. And it was just for me, when I finally got to the last sentence of the book and put the period and it said, ready to go to the copy editor. Uh, and I just got the copy editors, copy edits of the copy editing um, <laughs> yesterday. Uh, uh, I mean, I, they're done with it now. Now it's going to the, the composition part. Um, so I, for the first time, saw the pages. It was pretty thrilling, I got to say, yeah. because, yeah. you know, the, some of the research in the last three years has just been completely consilient with the ideas from the 90s. And right. that's just very deeply rewarding. And, and my interns, you know, finding these findings, I think we're really thrilled. Well, yeah, I think, that, yeah, I think one of the things that just sort of putting my two senses as an observer who's been around through a lot of this, having been around you since the early 2000s, yeah. is, is that fundamentally, if, uh, if, if you can put on your um, earmuffs for a second, but actually the difference between you and a lot of, a lot of other people, uh, although some other people do this as well, is that you approach this from a position of the humanity. And uh, so the way in which you viewed the science. Now, I, I, another person that I have a lot to do with is uh, Ernest Rossi and uh, through him, Milton Erickson. And I've just been reviewing his 16 volumes of collected works, which has been mm. taken me six years. Uh, and uh, it, it, there too, you can go. And what I was doing in the reviews was saying, here's the science that actually reflects what he was saying in the 40s and 50s. And there's so much that's reflective of what you were you were saying and perceiving. And so it was kind of like the, the neuroscience um, uh, became a, 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 a glove that you fit around and found to fit the hand. Uh, you didn't try to make the hand uh, fit the glove of neuroscience. Oh yeah, yeah, that's I, beautiful, Richard. I think this yeah. was the thing. Yeah. No, it's really beautiful. I, I was at an attachment um, meeting where about, uh, I guess about 
maybe 18 of us or so uh, got together for a week to talk about the future of attachment research, you know, focusing especially on disorganized attachment and all that. And one of the people there was in charge of the, um, uh, what is it called, the literary estate of John Bowlby. Mm -hmm. And he was at the University of Cambridge. And so he asked me to write a paper with him um, and a colleague uh, uh, on um, some of John Bowlby's unpublished um, notes, his, his, his typewritten notes, you know. So I got these typewritten notes, and it was absolutely mind-blowing that he never published some of his thoughts from the 50s and 60s, were, which were about integration. Uh, oh, really? Uh, about integration. He never published this anywhere. And so the, the, the head of the literary state, you know, was so excited to have me join him. So he says, you're not going to believe what you're about to read. <laughs> and there'd be like these handwritten notes on top of the typewritten notes. So it was such a wonderful um, article to write, to just quote, because we had permission, of course, this guy's in charge of the state, to put these unpublished <coughs> statements that are completely conciliant, you know, 60 years later wow. with now this interpersonal neurobiology view. So that's an example of how... You know, um, consilience is such a fun frame of mind to work in. And, and certainly the power of showing up is just that. It's like, how do you then say uh, for a parent, OK, look, we're, if you want to read the science, you can read the developing mind or these you know, peer reviewed journal articles. That's great. They're all wonderful. They have their own place. But for you as a busy parent, how can we offer you like a synthesis of that stance for example, that the mind emerges from energy flow and that your relationship is about energy sharing and it's symbolic patterns called information and how you integrate that or not in a relationship will lead to the integration of your child's brain. And you do this through four fundamental S's that we can talk about so that we then made it really, really accessible that you got these four S's that parents you know, can rally around and, um, and then when they say, what's the science? And I said, well, you know, you could read The Developing Mind. You could read any of the, you know, textbooks on that look at integration. Uh, if you want to go broader, you can read the 75 textbooks we have in the Interpersonal Neurobiology series, you know, um, and all. So, so, but if you don't want to do any of that, just read this book. Here, here's, here's the take home message of what you can do. And it's been so exciting because, you know, um, Parents can remember these four S's like that, and they are when you know they are completely based on the most current, literally most current, even unpublished material from the study of attachment. Mm -hmm. can, can we go through those four S's? Sure. So the first thing to say is that you want to remind parents if you're teaching this to them what we started with. There's no such thing as perfect parenting. Yeah. So. In each of these S's we're about to go through, recognize that we all are misaligned, not always aligned. There are ruptures in our connection, even though we want connection. So reconnection and repair are how you always want to start your clinical work or your personal work if you're a parent or your educational work if you're a teacher, you know, and just so people don't freak out. I mean, that's really the important thing. Right. And the reason Mary and I and Tina and I and myself by myself write all the bloopers we did as parents is that it's really important, I think, that someone listening to you doesn't think, oh, you're the parenting expert. I'm the big goof off. No, there's no such thing as a parenting expert. There's just a parent who's trying their best. And, and just like Louis Pasteur said, chance favors the prepared mind. I think the notion is to prepare the reader's mind so that they understand the science of attachment, knowing there's no such thing as perfect parenting, but recognizing these S's are found all around the planet. And what are they? The first S is safety. And it has two components to it that you often only think of the first one. The first of the two is protecting your child from harm, meaning that, you know, your job as a mammal for 200 million years as a attachment figure is to protect your dependent youth so they don't die. Yep. Yep. You know, feeding them, keeping them warm from the cold, etc. Um, 
the the second thing about that is to not be a source of terror because from an attachment point of view what we think goes on is the deeper networks in the brain that are about 300 million years old say if i'm being terrified i've got to go away from the source of terror mm -hmm. that's an old reptilian reaction to threat but the mammalian reaction to threat which is about 200 million years old says if i'm in a state of reactivity because i'm threatened i've got to go toward my attachment figure to protect me if the attachment figure a person is both is the source of terror your deeper network says get away your newer 200 million year old network says go toward and you are unable to resolve that paradox yeah. and so you fragment yeah. so you know in this meeting we had recently you know with all these researchers and disorganized attachment sadly we had thought originally about 15 years ago that if you had a background of security as you got older you'd do much better than a background of avoidance or a background of ambivalence but it turned out that not to be the case that disorganized attachment sadly dominates even if you have a lot of other good stuff going on. So at least that's what the research shows. You know, you don't want to give up, but you want to just say disorganized attachment has the most concerning outcomes, difficulty regulating emotion, difficulty having mutually rewarding relationships, fragmentation of um, rational thinking under stress, um, and the clinical finding, the only one with an absolutely robust clinical finding of clinical degrees of dissociation. You know, depersonalization, derealization, uh, memory difficulties, and at the extreme, dissociative identity disorder. So, um, you know, this is a big deal that attachment researchers, not clinicians, not even looking for this, found that if you're terrified of your parents and it's not repaired, then your child will likely have a disorganized attachment with you. And then as they go forward in life, they will have dissociation as a background. And that's a treatable condition, but if we can prevent it, that would be uh, the most ideal outcome. So that's the first thing, safety. And we start with that because, you know, we want to let parents know, look, this is something that a lot of us do. We terrify our kids. We don't mean to, but we do. It doesn't have to be abuse only, like abuse and neglect, developmental trauma. Beyond that, it can be just you're really angry at your partner when you come home or you're screaming at a politician on the television. I don't know who that might be, you know, or you're, you're getting drunk, you know, or you yourself are dissociating. These can all be non-abuse based. That is a child would not be removed from the family for that, but they can lead to disorganized attachments about five to 15% of the non-clinical population and over about 80% plus for the clinical population can have disorganized attachment. Mm -hmm. So that's the first one, safety. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it was lovely. I, don't, I, I remember my son, I just I know you're going on, but just a quick voice in between it, when I was sadly getting divorced and there was that terrible thing where the wife says, you've ruined your children. And I went up and said to my son, I said, you know, did I make mistakes? And he said, yeah, sure, dad, but uh, you learned. You learned. <laughs> And uh, that was what encouraged him. He was inspired by the fact that even dad could make mistakes and you learn stuff. So exactly, just, just adding that. So I, so I was, I was uh, unsafe for him. But then I, then I altered it, you know, to safety. Exactly. And you know, Richard, that's a beautiful thing you're saying because Ed Tronic has a new book coming out with a colleague. Um, I think her name is something Gold. Beautiful book. I think it's called like the Power of discord or something like that. I forgot the name of the book. It's a beautiful book. And it, um, basically, he says just what you're saying that kids develop resilience, when they realize the inevitable ruptures in our connections with them can be, I think the formal scientific term is repaired. Mm. And, and that's okay. But you know, it's this reconnection that you establish after there's a disconnection. So that's the first S safety. And we start with that. And it's a hard one to start with. But we wanted to because you know, it's so crucial that parents take a deep breath and go, you know, I think I have been terrifying my kid. I don't mean to, mm -hmm. but I've been doing it. And let me try to learn, you know. Yeah. And um, the second S is about something a little more subtle, but just as significant. It's called SEEN, S-E-E-N. 
you know, and it, it relates to this word mindsight, you know, that I developed as a word to save my life when I was in medical school and none of my professors seemed to have it, you know, <laughs> seeing people's feelings or thoughts or the subjective experience of meaning making or your story or all that stuff. And when I was told in medical school, stop asking your patients how they feel. It's like, why? And they go, that's not what doctors do. You know, and then years later, we'd find out, in fact, that's what doctors should do because it improves the immune function of the patient. It actually can even help them get over their cold a day sooner. Um, so we connect with each other. These energy and information fields, when you're empathically tuning into the internal world of the other, that's called being seen, you're using your mindset networks in your own brain to make a map of the internal subjective experience of the other, so, you know, new, newer terms are things like mentalization, reflective function, mind mindedness, psychological mindedness. A slightly older term would be theory of mind. Um, all those not exactly the same, but, you know, they're getting in the same ballpark. Yeah. Um, so being seen means you're using your mind sight networks so that you see beneath the behavior of your child. And the research is really clear when children are seen, they feel felt, they experience being known by you. And what that experience teaches your child is there is an inner world beneath the world of behavior, a world of emotion, of meaning, of thought, of memory, that's really significant, even though we may label it as subjective experience, it is objectively the most important part of our lives. So we get in trouble with the words we have. Oh, that's just subjective experience, a scientist will say. Well, the true science of health is that your subjective life is the most important part, objectively, of your objective well being. <laughs> you know, so it's like no, right. the words get in the way, right? So that's what being seen is. And, and you can teach people mindset, it's a learnable skill. So we've got that, that beautiful aspect there. And the uh, so I don't know, I think, Matt, we're ready for, for number three, the third S. Yeah, the third S is soothed, S-O-O-T-H-E-D. It's where when you're you know protecting your child with safety and you're seeing them, when you feel your child's distress, instead of running from it or, as some parents do, punishing them for it or telling them they shouldn't feel it, you are present with it. Their fear, their anger, their sadness, their being confused, or even like with climate challenges we have today, you know, we need to put our own oxygen mask first so that when we actually deal with the fires in Australia, you know, where you guys are now, or the fires we have here in California, or the storms, the flooding, the, the, the climate migration we're having, the, the incredible, you know, we're in a moment of, of real shift and catastrophe that can feel completely overwhelming. And so parents who say, oh, it's so fine, it's fine, it's fine. They're missing the point that their child is actually very aware of what's going on. And there's something that's maybe a part of this that we should just name called epistemic trust. And that's a beautiful phrase that Peter Fonagy has brought into the attachment world, which means Epistemology is how we know what we know or think we know what we know. So epistemic trust is can you turn to your attachment figures and rely on them conveying to you an accurate portrayal of truth? Mm -hmm. So, you know, we do this with our mother, our father, other attachment figures, because we have allo parenting more than one attachment figure. But then we use it with our friends when they're attachment figures or our teachers or mm -hmm. our romantic partners or the head of a company or maybe the head of a country, you know, to turn to them for reliable conveyance of truth. Yeah. And when there's a violation to epistemic trust, it creates incredible distress, mm. Mm. which I think is what we're seeing with some of the leaders in various countries in this planet, right. when there's a, a denial of what's happening with climate issues, you know, so it goes deep into our attachment history. And this idea of the third S soothing, you know, all these are basically where someone's tuning into you, keeping you safe, tuning into you, seeing you, tuning into you, feeling your discomfort. And in the joining that they do, they're able to soothe that distress 
and bring you to a state of clarity and calm of connection that are what we mean by soothing. And of course, with any of these S's, when they're not there, you make a repair. So there's no such thing as perfect parenting. Kids aren't always safe with you. Kids aren't always seen. Kids aren't always soothed. But then you go, whoops, I didn't soothe when I could have. Now I'm going to connect first, soothe, and then redirect. And you learn, you know, to do these with kindness toward yourself. Wonderful. Yeah, Wonderful. yeah we, uh, one of the things I've been working a lot and actually came out of my acting school days, really, the, the, the language was uh, uh, that we have responsiveness and reactiveness. And yes. That, that reactiveness has some um, implications and connotations, as you say, it can be do the right thing, be this, be that. But that, that responsiveness, and that also comes into the, you know, Alan Shaw's work, you know, hemisphere to hemisphere type of, type mm. of work of being, being in the same space with them. Uh, you, can't, you can't sue someone's emotions with logic, nor their logical questions with just emotions type of, uh, of simplicity, you know, simplistic explanation of it. So that soothe is, you know, be in the same frame. And it's, uh, and sometimes I've seen you talk about this, is you actually ask them what frame they're in. And, and, and in the book, you use uh, not only sort of written words, of course, and, and then you have sort of highlights that you pull out, but you actually use some little uh, cartoon type uh, descriptions yes. to show the behaviors that, to give people mm. a sort of a model, uh, which is nice. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Because, you know, um, some of us learn more by drawing, some learn more by just ideas. Yeah, exactly, Richard. And, and, and you know, we do talk about the left side, left mode, right mode. Um, and in general, you know, when you, you can give people reassurance of safety, of being seen, of being soothed, you can teach them that you're moving toward the fourth S, which is this kind of ultimate model of security, um, you know, and Bowlby and Ainsworth, uh, Mary Ainsworth and John Bowlby call this a working model. And the, the really important thing to state is that whatever your working model was as a child, you can take the time to reflect on the past, make sense of what your childhood was like, move yourself from various forms of insecurity, including the unresolved trauma and unresolved loss that are the most common adult findings that are associated with the child's having disorganized attachment. And you can move yourself towards security because a working model of security basically is where, if you think about it this way, you know, parents perform two basic functions. One is they're a safe haven. So for the child to go to for comfort, for connection, for being seen, for being soothed, all that stuff. But then you're a launching pad because your child isn't going to hang with you their whole life as, you know, sadly we know, <laughs> you know, they're going to launch. And, right. And, you know, so this longing, you know, for connection is so beautiful, but you're not just a safe haven, you're a launching pad. And this happens, you know, now, you know, I think we all have maybe adult children now, but, you know, they come back in that safe haven function for a few moments and that old launching pad role, they're already launched. But when they were younger, they needed that stable launching pad to jump off into the world. Now, the secure model, this fourth S, is really saying, have I learned that my parent could show up for me in a reliable way? And when it's not there, they make a repair, a reconnection. Can I take that learning of that skill and actually show up for my friends and my romantic partners and ultimately for my kids? And even can I show up for myself? Can I keep myself safe? Can I keep myself seen? Can I keep myself soothed? So I have the security. And this is where, you know, what's been so fun about the book is I know it sounds simplistic to reduce the entire field of 50 years of attachment research into four S's, but in actuality, because I was literally doing the developing mind third edition at the exact time that Tina and I were writing this book, everything in the power of showing up comes from a deep dive into this view of secure attachment and its relationship to integration relationally leading to integration neurologically leading to optimal regulation leading to resilience well-being compassion kindness all these cool things so since that was the backdrop of of the science part we could just use it 
to to infuse the power of showing up book with that you know review of the science and then place it like that and say hey it actually comes down to four s's <laughs> you learn this you're good to go you know and yeah. so i can see if if you weren't familiar with the science background you might go wow these authors they're so reductionistic four s's for the entire 50 years of attachment research i don't buy it and then what i say to them is i say i'm i'm with you i wouldn't buy it either here's a book you could read the yeah. developing mind third edition have yeah. at it you know yeah. well, <laughs> so. well i'd like to reframe it uh, actually i get that point that we get this because we think that our knowledge comes from education but going back to my point before saying that the reason why a lot of your stuff is so uh, proved have this longevity is that it started with the human being and uh, mm. didn't change with love. And I'd, I'd actually like to suggest that the four S's are our natural way of being and that uh, from that an entire field of research has emerged. So mm. rather than the fact that you've reduced it down to this, what we did was we expanded it out into attachment theory <laughs> and all you've done is yeah. just gone back to the source. Um, and perhaps I'm a little simplistic, but I think uh, that very much so. Yeah, no, no, that feels right. It feels right. And um, yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you for that, Richard. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, a motor vehicle has, is a very complex machine, but we only have a few controls that we need to learn, right, to, to drive the car. So um, exactly. Know. Yeah. And that's, you know, what's so fun about it, I guess, two things. I mean, one, when you make sure that you keep your finger on the pulse of cross cultural, mm. um, reality you know that these these s's are across cultures this is not just in european centric cultures and the second thing is the consilient uh, approach of interpersonal neurobiology you know we say gosh um if you find something related to uh, truth it ought to match with what you know anthropology is finding across cultures sociology is finding in groups psychology is finding in individuals or in families or in, in in couples or biology in general is finding in neuroscience or genetics or epigenetics and you know or chemistry with molecules or physics you know or mathematics even and this is where i think you know whether you're applying it uh, like you two do in the science of psychotherapy or you're applying it to let's say parenting like our discussion today is about or even you know to the larger issue of climate and um, not just environmental justice but social justice one of the ways of seeing the common ground across all those things is the reality of interconnection uh, is what's in common across all those things and i think what's happened is you know modern culture uh, as I think we've discussed before, I think has given us a false view of our separateness that gets embedded in our linguistic symbols like self or mind being separate from other people's selves and that it's just in your body or in your head, that we have these concepts of separation, that we have this category that, oh yeah, there's self and other, and that we get lost in these energy and information flow patterns that emerge within culture are reinforced within schools science reaffirms it you know families even unfortunately reinforce it they call me danny you matthew you richard and then we think that that means the self is separate so you know part of what tina and i try to do it in the power of showing up is to say look it isn't just a me and a body that you're trying to help grow in your kid they are who their identity is is equally a relational field connected to other people not even with skin color like theirs or religious beliefs like theirs or nationalities like theirs their passport may not be the same but all humanity and not just humanity all species all living beings so that's the we and you know we say the me plus the we equals the we mwe this integrated self and what's been really interesting about the we concept is that it creates a category of identity that embeds both the individuality as a differentiated thing yes you have a body and the connectedness that you don't have to do one or the other you can have both in one category of identity that has a concept of we of an integrated identity and then even a fun word so we're going around the planet getting from every language every culture with different languages that we can find 
what their equivalent of me plus we plus equals we, we would be. Mm. So I invite you to, to join us here at the Mindsight Institute and really seeing how can we as a collective humanity come up with words in our different languages that are saying, this may be the root of why we treat earth like a trash can. Yeah, right. And that the solution to climate crisis is to realize, yes, it's terrifying, but yes, it actually might be not just a burden, but an opportunity, a privilege, a wonderful moment mm. to get so many people so worried that they get motivated to shock themselves out of the, what you know, E.O. Wilson calls an illusion of separateness, a false perception, and Einstein calls an optical delusion of consciousness, a psychotic belief. So, you know, what I try to do for myself every morning when I do the wheel of awareness and then get ready for the day is I think, what are the ways I can bring more integration into the world at the level of, you know, people's identities? And we has been a thing that keeps me uh, going in spite of all the different things we're experiencing now on Earth. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing. I mean, you, you look at these linguistic frames. I mean, one of the, we, you've talked about this before, but I remember at the, at the IPNB conference uh, last year, which was the, the last one, but uh, I was just sitting there and reflecting on the, uh, the tradition of the, particularly the, the American Indians, uh, to name their children uh, based on an environmental uh, Site. They would just they would look out and see eagle. Okay, you're flying eagle, and just this this um, linguistic integration of uh, uh, of I am a part of something else, and this this exercise in solipsism. Which so we've been playing with this for a couple of thousand, two and a half, three thousand years philosophically. It's uh, I think it's beautifully proved to be uh, uh, wrong. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And, you know, it started with Hippocrates, you know, in yeah. at least at least, you know, 2,500 years ago when in the book called On the Sacred Disease, he said, well, the mind just comes from your head. And unfortunately, I don't think he meant this, but, you know, um, that would mean that the self, which people feel was a creation of the mind, is emerging from your head alone instead of your relationships. And that's not an indigenous people's view. No. That's kind of the view of modern philosophy and modern medicine. And so we get, it's like fish in a fish tank, you know, or, you know, in the ocean, you don't really know the water you're swimming. In. We swim in the noosphere, the world of information that uh, Delard de Chardin talked about, you know, this culture, what culture is, is we swim in this ocean of ideas and one of the toxic ideas is of the separate self. Yeah. So in most languages, um, you get a linguistic symbol that tells you who you are is in that body. And there's a category called self that's different from other. Mm. And it's why I've been pushing for us to consider words like self-regulation. You know, I try to call it inner regulation or interregulation right. or self-compassion should be called inner compassion. And the other is intercompassion or even things like, you know, self-awareness. Well, let's be very careful of these words because they are like hidden toxins that keep on poisoning our individual and collective ways we understand things so that, you know, the fun thing about we is you say it, people smile, they laugh, and they go, oh, I get it. I have a feeling of relief. I am not just this body. I am all of us here listening to this podcast now. I am the trees. I am the water. I am the sky. Literally like that. So I recently did a social justice meeting, and they wanted us to start with um, – you know, our positionality is the word and, you know, to identify as white, to identify as male or, or non-binary. And I said, I said, I want to participate in this and I'm going to do it as best I can, but I need your help because I guess the furthest extent I would go with this to feel authentic and honest with my experience is I will identify, my, identify myself as a living being on earth. But beyond that, and I will distinguish myself in a sense from a rock, that I am a living being. But I actually feel like the trees surrounding this, you know, auditorium are me. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. And the and and the world, even the water, is me. I'm a you know, so maybe I need to go beyond just living beings. But 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 if you are going to tell me that I'm a human being, I start feeling uncomfortable because I think I'm more than that. And if you tell me I'm a white human being, then I feel really like, what does that really mean? And then if you go, you know, a male white human being, I go, I understand culture wants to put me in that category. And I understand there may be a white privilege going on here that I don't need to worry that I'm black and people disregard me. So I am a white male. So I'm the dominant one in America or whatever. I totally respect that. And let's talk about that. But if you're asking me from the inside out what my identity is, I got to just be honest and say, I'll go with living being on earth. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Let's go back to the back to the naturalness and move out from there rather than uh, the confusions that we're in. And, and so much of this, though, just bringing it back to the book in this yeah. very straightforward and uh, together way. I mean, what this what we've been just wandering into in the last five or minutes or so, which is the natural philosophical uh, and um, uh, uh, heartfelt. So philosophy is not just this weird, strange thing. It's a heartfelt uh, engagement. Um, that's where you wander out to. And that's another thing I find in this book. I, I read a couple of reviews saying, oh, well, it says pretty straightforward stuff. But I'm a great one for exactly as you're saying with parenting, exactly the same with books. It becomes a springboard. Where do you spring from this? What do you create from these four S's? Where do, mm. where do you go? What's the stuff that Dan never said? What's the stuff that, 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 that when I'm talking about it, that Richard never thought of? That's what gets exciting. And uh, yeah, yeah. it yeah. becomes this, I'm not a part of any, I'm not a, a particular thing. I'm a part of this grand um, living experience. Mm. Uh, exactly. And uh, well, what happens when when I put my little drop of dye into the uh, into the exposure? And that that's the the stuff we're touching on in the end there. And so maybe if we leave people with not so much a conclusion, but as that question and that curiosity that that you've you've just put forward there, unless you would like to actually round it off into a particular point. But- no, I think I think the beautiful thing, you know, about dropping into presence and in a sense coming to live more like a verb than a noun is one way I talk about it in the book Aware. But that presence, the science of presence and the book, uh, The Power of Showing Up is all about parental presence. And whether you apply that just to parenting or how we live on the planet, you know, it is providing safety. It is, you know, seeing the inner life of people. It is soothing when there's distress and it is developing the security. You can live a life of these four S's even if you have no children. And um, I think if we can show up for each other this way and show up for nature this way, everything that we write in The Power of Showing Up is about relationality and relationships that promote resilience. And this is, I think, the way we need to, to relate to earth and that's yeah. that's what i would say and thank you too for inviting me to to show up with you well yeah. you did and remember uh, buy this book if you're a parent and buy this book if you're a human being because uh, <laughs> we are we are all family yes we well that's family. right I would say this is a very good resource for many of our listeners are therapists themselves. And I think this is a great resource to be able to direct clients to uh, many of our uh, readers will have the, um, the developing mind under their belt. And so this is a great resource then to pass on to clients. So I'd encourage people to do that. Beautiful. Well, Dr. thank Dan, you too very much. Dr. Dan right, Siegel right. it has been wonderful having you on the show. Thank you very much. And thank you for the great projects that you've done and the awareness that you've brought to us as a collective. A pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Okay, Dan, I'll okay. have to see you around the circuit. I'm still out there doing stuff and I'll try and catch up with you. I'll, I'll see you at the evolution. Yeah. Which is I'll see you there. Great. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.